Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, 5G in Defense with Leland Brown. So yeah, Department of Defense, you know, when I first came out of college, we were looking at ways to uh, apply 2G technologies, wireless LAN and Bluetooth for advanced wireless applications to enable the soldier to, for, to, to capture situational, you know, awareness, um, you know, uh, information of, of, of the, of within the battle space, command and control and the like. I can go through all these different acronyms as to what we want to enable the soldier to do in 2001. <laughs> Right. We're wow. in 2021 and you can literally see the same capability requests now. The difference is we have the technology to adhere to that request, meaning enable that. And the reason why you see the Department of Defense looking so heavily into 5G is because now those monolithic constructs, such as utilizing one RAN architecture and being stuck with it, is gone. Now you're software defined. So that gives them the flexibility to, to build new capabilities quicker, right? And you can scale it, right? You can scale it to yeah. different uh, use cases. And the level of control in terms of the uh, technology deployment cannot be placed into the hands of the, you know, in, in, in well, say not, I'm, I'm going to say in, in, uh, in endpoint, but definitely a group that can now control how the technology is deployed and utilized as compared to having the sole dependency on the, on the carrier or the, uh, or the uh, RAN developer. So you can what deploy the, what your that, own networks. Yeah, so what, that, what that's telling me is that I can deploy new capabilities much faster because I don't, have a depend- I don't have a dependency on this big monolithic thing that used to be out there because I can deploy my own types of networks any way I want now, basically, with, with 5G because it's more open. So I can be more prescriptive on what I need, specific to what I need, based off of the standards uh, that are out there. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. So, you know, that's it, the attraction of the of the federal government to this is because of the massive flexibility scared us to different use cases, right? So you're enabling, you know, the joint forces, you know, to drive 5G into their capability requirements or operation requirements, right? And when you look at what's happening, the commercial side of 5G, they're driven by a strategy, a strategy of developing revenue, right? But that doesn't necessarily line up to the uh, mission requirements of the federal government or, the, or the, uh, the Department of Defense. So the only link that you see now be between the two worlds as they blur, because you're seeing traditional federal companies go into the commercial space and vice versa. You're seeing AT&T and Verizon looking at federal use cases and a lot, you know, Lockheed Martin and like with their 5G.mil program, they're looking into the commercial space as well. So they're blurring. Difference is who understands mission and who's driving revenue for, for the purpose of, of revenue by generation, right? So the mission and understanding the mission, that's why it's so important to understand how you can take 5G and adopt it, hence the driving factor for all these 5G requests for uh, prototype proposals. Well, that, 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 that makes sense, more sense to me now. Now, one thing, you, you, showed a, you showed a diagram to me earlier. It was really cool because it looked like I could create my own private 5G network around maybe just a group of soldiers. Yeah, that that's their own private securities baked in all that all that's kind of in in their own little thing. It just has to do with frequency um, spectrum, right, and licensing right. and all that stuff. But it's so flexible though that I could basically create my own five G network. Is that? Am I understanding Correct. that right? It's, it's so you said something that's called non non standalone networks, which really built. It's really the RAN is the extension away from the traditional 4G core, the existing 4G core, right? So it's really your RAN boxes are 5G, which I say 90% of your uh, your uh, commercial deployments are non-standalone networks, meaning you have a 4G evolved packet core that's still existing and you have your, your 5G RAN connected to it. It's probably the simplest way to, uh, to uh, describe it. What you're seeing now is which is you know, the interest of the Department of Defense, is standalone networks where you have a complete 
5G core, 5G RAN, uh, 5G devices, even multi radio access technologies, or what we call RAT, okay, R A T, uh, where you have a Wi Fi network along with 5G, along with even a satellite communications network, all deployed within a battle space. So you can have a standalone 5G network for a group of soldiers. You can also have a, a, a small form factor um, uh, base stations for vehicular platforms, right? And you have this multi-domain comms architecture that comes into play where you can have even drones uh, deployed with some type of 5G node or some type of 5G access point, even up to what, what we're seeing now, interest in deploying 5G space applications. So all these various multi-domains, when you think think about it, it now provides you the ability to scale across these multiple uh, use cases and these various types of um, of, uh, of uh, workloads. It's the same thing on the commercial side, you know, you, you know, you, you know, logistics and different types of uh, warehouses where they can have their own standalone networks. The key thing that we all have to bring into account is who owns the frequency. Yeah, the frequency. Yeah. Is, yeah, that's always, you know, the issue that the carriers own, own the frequencies and they're never letting that go. I, I wish I had, I wish I was alive back in 1980 when they were giving out frequency blocks. <laughs> I would have been, hey, give me one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because right now, I mean, that's the, that's the golden egg. You know, if right. you were. Now, is, isn't there some frequencies in 5G that I can operate privately? Yes. Yes. Right, have, so there uh, is some free spectrum out there that I can that have limited um, range and things like that, right? So I could put a 5G network in my own warehouse on a base, for example, right? That right. ran all my IoT devices, for example. Correct. Uh, there's a lot of interest in your C- CBRS bands uh, and, and, and your other unlicensed bands, if you will. Reason being is that those bands aren't controlled or, or beholden to the uh, carriers. You know, even though you have carriers uh, like AT and T that have their their uh, first net, um, you know that's a whole another discussion. But yes, to answer your question in short, yes, you can. Uh, the issue is, un- 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 unlicensed isn't necessarily unlicensed everywhere. Okay? Oh, interesting. Yeah, like even in terms of your ISM bands for uh, wireless LAN or Wi-Fi. Uh, that's a very crowded band because it's unlicensed, right? A lot of your Bluetooth bands work on your ISM bands. It's unlicensed, a very crowded band. So you, you got to take into account when, when you're working in un, unlicensed bands, the, the, the rule is you must give and accept interference and have your technology work around that, right? So that's one aspect, so, so why, which is why you're seeing a lot of these experiments around what we call dynamic spectrum access, dynamic spectrum sharing, where even though you don't own the frequency, you still have the ability to access it and kind of function dynamically and you know, with the ownership of the, car- of the, of the frequency, whether it be a carrier or, or, or what have you. Augmented the fact, when you look at, at, a, at a federal uh, use cases, you, you can't you can't be, uh, you know, blocked into your your operations in the uh, U.S. Most of your soldiers are deployed outside of the uh, U- U.S., so there's frequency yeah. blocks over there that you don't have access or, or uh, control over. So it's much more complicated than I thought. Yeah, it's probably of all of the experimentations that you're seeing or uh, technology developments within 5G, I... I feel that spectrum access is the one it's of the probably large, the biggest. So it's probably the biggest, if not right, 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 right up there at the top tide. Because um, you, you know, deploying these these standalone networks, you, you you know you you will require access to frequency, and in many key cases, unlicensed bands may not be the option that you can really you know right. you know, depend upon. All right, Leland, I'm going to put, I'm going to, you got to put your wizard hat on and get your crystal ball out. Cool. You, you knew about the PDA cell phone coming together before it happened. What's 5G going to unleash? I need to know who to invest in. I believe 5G is going to unleash the, this will disappear. Oh, okay. yeah. I, 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 I only have yeah. one, Leland. I don't know why Intel gave you three. I just have one. 
So I have four, actually. I didn't pick up the other one. Um, yeah, so and uh, I'll tell you that real quick. I, I have a tendency to look at all four networks, let's say all three net networks now, because Sprint and uh, T-Mobile will merge and like to look at throughputs and do speed tests and the like just to see who's working better in the area. That's just what I like to do. That's one of my little pet peeves of like, you know, who has the best cellular service in the area. But in any case, where you saw broadband in the hand, right? Uh-huh. And you saw within 4G, what was driving 4G was really, you know, us, you know, people. We were driving, you know, the usage of uh, 4G. 5G will be driven by machines and by people, okay? And as time goes on, you'll see it where it's so integrated into your life, you may not even know, know it's there. So, like, for instance, walking out, a lot of these, you know, pattern recognition um, uh, you know, platforms that you see now, um, you know, there's no, you know, to, there's, there, there is no person involved in that. There's, there's a system that's going on and time finding patterns, whether it be facial recognition and the like. Um, autonomous vehicles, you know, they'll be, you know, connected via, via 5G. Uh, I can go on and on, you know, I don't, I don't know about my, my, uh, my, you know, about my kitchen having all these different connections. I'm not too trusting in that. But cameras and the like, you know, where your broadband access will be integrated into you, your mm-hmm. person, your 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 your, your uh, digital, let's say, footprint in a way. What I mean by that is not necessarily which the data that you're, you know, uh, that you're, you know, developing or making. Your footprint meaning how 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 are you connected beyond your cell phone, you. You have connection in your car, connection in your house, connection where you have this whole new portfolio of you all connected without you making the connection. It's just seamless. You just moving around and needing data and having access to it where you don't have to have this in your hand anymore. So that's what I see. Um, I won't say that this will go away completely, but the need to have it will dramatically reduce as we begin to see wireless access deployed in all parts of our lives. Wow. That it, it's going to be a fascinating 10 years. Yeah. Fascinating 10 years. And honestly, uh, I will make the prediction on your show. <laughs> the G will go away. The G it, will it, go it, away. All right. The G will go away. And, and honestly, you're, you're, you're already seeing it where you're seeing next G XG, beyond 5G, B5G. They're trying to find a way because you keep putting G's in here. You just kind of, it's really a, uh, a cellular commercial toy. Well, I was going to say, yeah, what, what are all the telcos going to do when they try and sell me a new phone with the latest G on it, right? I'm, they're going to have well, to come up with something else. Come up, could, could, uh, honestly, come up with, with uh, something else or just say, hey, this phone can now give you access to, I don't know, space coverage or something like that. Or, hey, this phone can now drive your car. Or, or as I stated, if these go away, what are they going to sell you? I don't know. Yeah, that would that'd be, be very interesting. Yeah. Well, hey, Leland, this has been, this has been uh, very enlightening. We understand 5G better, what's going on beyond it. Any last words for our uh our audience, if they want to learn more about 5G, where do they go? Well, I'll tell you, the 3GPP standard is based on releases, right? And I'm going to go there because the driving force behind 5G is really the spec, the specifications coming out of uh, 3GPP. We are now at a release 16 timeframe. So, you know, for the technically inclined at heart, that wants to sit down and read a spec, definitely go there. You'll understand the shift between release 14 and release 15 and what does that mean to to the uh, industry as a whole. Uh, And I offer myself, as always, a point to put in contact, you know, to to, uh, reach out to. Uh, And there's quite a few different ways you can learn about 5G on the, you know, on the internet and just different um, white white papers and the like. I think I have a couple of white papers out there myself that that, that speak towards 5G, particularly for uh, federal uh, use cases. So a lot of ways to learn about it. And what I would like to leave is the one aspect of our networks that we need to have some better uh, technical capabilities on is the resiliency of the networks. Now, here's what I mean by that. You know, 
5G provides the 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 the, the it, you know the aspect in terms of different slices and services, connectivity and the like. But I have some personal experiences where resiliency was my main point. Uh, go back to 2001 when 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 the when the uh, terrorist attacks. I'm sitting on a base. The networks were clogged up. I couldn't reach my family. In 2010, I was sitting inside of a uh, of a building down in D.C. and this earthquake hit D.C. Right? That's like the rare rarest thing. The networks clogged up. Cell towers dropped down. I couldn't reach my family. Well, about two months ago, I'm living right outside of the Phil- out, 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 out the area of, uh, of, of, of of the Philadelphia area, and eight hurricanes through flew through here, F threes and F twos. Never happened before. <laughs> Not only being scared out of my mind, the networks were down. I couldn't reach my family. So the call to action to have the networks more resilient through the adoption of new technologies and to whatever we call the next phase of this, it's extremely important. Resilient networks are key for first responders, for federal use cases and commercial use cases. So resiliency to me is the next step. The next no, I, I, I totally agree with you on that one. As far as earthquakes go, uh, that, that's just commonplace out here in California. I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that resiliency could could be a major play in like forest fight fighting. Well, could you imagine if, if our forest fighters, cause that's a big deal here in California as well. You know, the earth shakes yeah. and everything burns. That's California. Mm-hmm. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could guarantee that our frontline for uh, f- firefighters were out there and had comms guaranteed. That would be, that would be incredible. Agree. And I think every point that I made was about first responders as well. In the background, you know, my most concern, can I reach my family at the same time? Can they have kind of continuous connectivity because they're on the front lines facing the dangers firsthand, you know, to save us and to help us. So, no, agreed. This is definitely a first responder call to action first to ensure that we're safe. You know, most definitely agreed. Well, great. Hey, Leland, thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, hey, thank you, Darren, as always. You're one of my favorite people on Intel. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Leland. <laughs>Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.